Right now, let me introduce you to um, uh, Secretary uh, Rodney Slater. Uh, Secretary Slater was the um, Secretary of Transportation in the Clinton administration a couple of eons ago, I believe. But no, Secretary Slater is a fantastic uh, person. He leads the uh, transportation, shipping, and logistics practice at Squire, Patton Boggs, and other participant in Blueprint 2025. Um, and he really focused on helping clients integrate their interests in the overall vision for the transportation system of the 21st century, a vision he set as a transportation secretary to promote safer, more efficient, environmentally sound, and sustainable worldwide transportation uh, infrastructure. But I think what, you know, what's important to me about Secretary Slater is that he's incredibly interested in improving our country's infrastructure, and he comes from uh, a background where he actually un understands what needs to be done. So as we think about the person who'd sit behind the desk on January 20th, 2017, and what they need to do, you know both what they need to do and how difficult it is and how creative you'd have to be to, to get that done. So thank you very much for coming. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Norman for that very warm and gracious introduction. I'd also like to uh, thank him for his leadership of this, the uh, ninth uh, Global Infrastructure uh, Leadership Forum. Uh, I think we'd all uh, wish to thank him for making us a part of the discussion. Uh, Garden Arbuckle back here is uh, one of my colleagues at uh, Squire Patton Boggs and has known uh, Norman for some time and was really insistent within the firm uh, that we step up and become a part of this uh, very important conversation. Uh, a conversation that will hopefully give us, uh, frankly, a new vision for transportation for a new age. Uh, this uh, 2025 uh, blueprint for action. Uh, I can tell you that uh, I almost chuckled when he was talking about being in the seat on the first day uh, I remember uh, the very first day that I was uh, uh, um, confirmed as secretary, I ended up on a telephone call in the late afternoon, uh, and uh, President Clinton was on the call. Uh, he made a couple of comments and uh, then uh, exited the call, but we were talking about a major pilot strike that was, frankly, about to occur. And uh, so there was all of this discussion, and uh, eventually someone said, well, Mr. Secretary, what do you think? Uh, and there was this pregnant silence, pause on the line. And I'm, I'm just as, uh, uh, as uh, engaged with um, everyone else uh, waiting to hear what the secretary was going to say. <laughs> uh, but uh, Secretary Pena had actually moved on, on to the uh, Department of Energy and was no longer there. And it finally dawned on me, Norman, that um, it was uh, for me to actually say something about the importance of uh, this issue. I only say that to say that sometimes we can find ourselves forced in a position of leadership without necessarily having a blueprint for action. Uh, and you can be prepared at the state and local level, as um, I had been prepared. I was a member of the Arkansas Highway Commission for some years and then traveled to uh, Washington uh, with then um, uh, the newly elected uh, president, President Clinton and Vice President Gore, uh, and was first uh, the Federal Highway Administrator. Uh, and all of these things have their, their stories uh, and um, Maybe with uh, more time, uh, we could get into some of those stories, but you still come uh, not fully appreciative of uh, the, the job and its magnitude. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, it has never failed me that I know best how to do a job uh, when I'm leaving it for another. Uh, and if we're all honest, that's pretty much the case. And so you really need good teams, uh, and you need people who can help you formulate uh, a vision. Uh, and so I think that this work is so very, very important. 
Uh, it's going to be important for a new administration that has to get its sea legs. Uh, and clearly with this campaign that uh, is really one that uh, is sort of anti-establishment, it could be that those who assume the awesome responsibility of leading our nation could actually be individuals with little to no uh, experience at the national level. Now, I can't imagine that because even if you come from outside of Washington, you always try to pair yourself with individuals who can help you manage the ship of state within Washington. Uh, it's no accident that, uh, uh, that uh, Governor Clinton from a small southern state would seek uh, a partner uh, like um, uh, Senator Al Gore who had served at the national level. So you can see that you naturally uh, seek to minimize uh, your own blind spots with others who have had um, uh, experience that you value. Uh, but you do come with the experiences that you have uh, established and lived uh, and experienced over time. And so President Clinton did come with that perspective of a governor, a person close to the people, uh, someone who said, you know, it's the economy, stupid, and let us work to put people first. I mean, those are the kinds of themes that sort of speak to that uh, sort of governmental focus at the, at the state level. And so whomever comes forth will necessarily have his or her strengths, but they'll also have some weaknesses and blind spots. And um, the best thing they can have uh, is the work product. Uh, a suggestion, as it will necessarily be, because they will have run on uh, various uh, themes and planks and the like, but a suggestion that is detailed that includes the kind of delicate balance that we heard from Susan and Terry and Andrew and Tim and Michael, uh, and the kind of vision piece that we heard from Terry and all of the other things that will be added to the stew over the next uh, few days. To be so fortunate as to have something like that uh, is is invaluable. And it, again, may not be something that you, you know, follow A to Z, but it clearly gives you something to read and to consider and to digest. And it clearly is something, if it has been debated and discussed and sort of um, gone through a process where you are, you know, just really getting down to the, the true and significant uh, nuggets of uh, insight and value. And I think that's what this process is all about. And I actually love the way that it's presented, not in some kind of hierarchical form, you know, with one to 10 or whatever, but in sort of a circular form the recognition that all pieces, valuable in and of themselves, but more valuable in their collective nature. nature. Much like opinions, valuable in and of themselves, but much more valuable when they are the result of collaboration. And so again, I encourage you to continue to engage in this very, very important work now, Emerson once said that once the mind reaches forth to embrace a new idea, it can never, ever return to its former state. There is something about a vision. There is something magical about an idea. But it is only that if there is no action. So there has to be the vision and the vigilance. And to the degree you can have examples of what this collaborative vision might manifest, then you actually create a taste 
by which your ideas might be enjoyed. And so I encourage you to not only put pen to paper with the concepts and the ideas, but identify the examples much as you're doing over the course of this meeting, where you can say this is going on here and this is going on there, and we know it works. So I encourage you to continue to do that. One or two other comments and then I'll be done. Uh, when I was secretary, at the end of our um, experience, uh, we had the luxury of, of, of thinking beyond the moment. Uh, we had passed all of the major pieces of legislation that was before us at the time, uh, whether it was the um, uh, Transportation Act for the 21st century, the Aviation Act for the 21st century, all of these 21st century provisions because our thought was to be driven by an idea and to try to reach out as far as we could with our own thinking and to have policy that would allow us to act on what we were thinking uh, and to bring some smart regulatory um, insights to the process. And so we, we attempted to do that. Well, we also sought to get our public and private sector partners and stakeholders involved as well. And uh, we engaged in an effort to produce what became known as uh, a document, the changing face of transportation. And it was for the year 2002, uh, 2025, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and I would encourage you to look at that document. I think there may be some things there for you because we talked about the importance of technology. We talked about safety as the North Star by which all of our transportation decisions should be measured. Uh, and we talked about our governments working better together and government working better with the private sector, all of those things. But this is something that um, uh, I'm a little embarrassed about. Uh, as we got into this work, um, we were well into it. And I discovered that there was actually a document that had been produced uh, during the Nixon administration, I mean, I'm sorry, during the Ford administration, uh, and Secretary William T. Coleman was the secretary at the time, uh, and it was called Trends and Choices. Uh, and its period of focus was from 1975 to the year 2000. I did not know about that document. Now my staff, especially the career staff, they may have known because clearly they were putting together wonderful work products for me to speak from and to build on. Because I invited them to be a part of our effort. I said, look, there are no political appointees and career uh, staff members. We're all a part of this 100,000 strong Department of Transportation. I want your insight in working with us to do what we hope to do during the time that we're here. But my point is, that document was there, and I was there, and had been there for seven years at the time, and did not know about it. Maybe I'd seen a reference to it or something like that, but I did not know about this document. Now, I say that to say a lot of times these documents become um, bookends. You know, we do them and we set them on a shelf and we admire the cover and we reflect on all of the work that went into preparing them. But we don't always make them really a plan of action. A blueprint suggests that. It suggests that this is something that provides the outline, maybe the architecture, but that ultimately things have to be filled in. And that's where the work comes in. And if that document is on the desk of the secretary and all of the modal administrators, and it's a part of the family of that department, and if it's distributed to the state DOTs and all of the transit authorities, and if there are individuals like yourselves who have an opportunity to 
ask a question of the new secretary and you mention that blueprint. And if this is the group early on in that administration that gets to the secretary, and really even before the person is selected, you get to uh, the members of the transition team. And by the way, that process starts earlier than you think. That process could easily start in um, June, July. There are actually people already thinking about it, okay? So the work could not be more important and more timely. And now this last point. It matters not so much what you look at, as Thoreau would say, but what you see. Okay? It matters not so much what you look at, but what you see. You have the opportunity to say to all of us, this is what you think because of what you are looking at. But this is what we see. You see, we see the mighty oak tree and the small acorn. We see our ability to move beyond the current state to a future state that is worthy of our hopes and dreams and that continues to enable us to believe and to say and to know that we can be the most mobile and the most connected societies and the most equitable in that regard to have ever existed in the history of the world. That is the goal of the blueprint, and that is what makes it a worthy effort indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary Slater. That was phenomenal and much appreciated. Are there any questions for the Secretary? I. Uh, I have a question if no one else has a question. One of the uh, issues I have is, at some level, why has it taken us so long to really get moving in terms of uh, developing uh, increased investment in infrastructure? It's obviously so critical for our well-being, as you mentioned. Sure. Well, first of all, you've had a lot of measures move at the state and local level, not so much as at the federal level of late. But we did get a multi-year uh, bill uh, just this past December. So even the Congress uh, can move along with the administration when uh, the pressure bills. Uh, I was with Secretary Fox uh, after uh, the bill had passed, and I told him, I said, you know, Mr. Secretary, they love you uh, when you provide good leadership, but they really, really love you when you get their money. Uh, and so the Department of Transportation, with all of its modes and with its great partnership with state and local governments, it needed the resources. I mean, you have to have the resources to do the work uh, that uh, we're all uh, engaged in. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think we're on a roll here. I think it's important to engage the private sector. Andrew, you talked about that. Uh, by the way, I was in Manchester uh, just a week or so ago, and they were talking about this big northern powerhouse initiative. Uh, which was fascinating, uh, because you're talking about Manchester, one of the most, uh, probably the first really uh, industrial city in the world, I would think, uh, and how at one point it represent probably one of the richest areas and regions of uh, the UK. And now, you know, with some uh, need for development, uh, it is a uh, region that is seeking uh, a future that is as grand as its past. Uh, I think the same kind of story can be told by those of us who say hail from the South. Many of us uh, don't really remember uh, that uh, before the Civil War, most of the most, um, the wealthiest counties in the U.S. were in the South for the most part. And cotton was king. 
for the most part. But then after this uh, great challenge that we faced uh, to really deal with maybe issues of, uh, of, of equity and making sure that the whole nation was a part of the union in our effort to make it more perfect, then our southern region uh, lost uh, really that, that strength of agriculture as we know it to lift a region. And so now uh, it is a region that is remaking itself. It is rising again uh, with mechanization, with technology playing an important role, with transportation playing an important role. I mean, Hartsville is the busiest airport uh, in the country and uh, clearly one of the leaders uh, in airports in the world. Uh, your Miami ports, your ports in the Gulf. I mean, all of these ports are gonna do very, very well uh, when the uh, newly reconstructed uh, Panama Canal uh, opens a little later this year and all, a lot of that traffic starts to move in different directions. So wherever you know, communities find themselves, they've been able to make the case for investment a lot of times easier as they are local and people can see the benefit. And at the federal level, frankly, we've just been uh, too uh, bogged down in dealing with the, the petty and the trivial uh, uh, for too long. Uh, and our uh, infrastructure system has suffered as a result of that. Mr. Secretary, thank you for your comments today. My name is Chris Coakley and I work for Saltchuck. We're a privately held freight transportation company. And my, my question to you is that having, uh, having served as the secretary, what sort of uh, importance is placed on the advisory committees, the many different advisory committees that uh, serve both the agencies and Congress? And I'm thinking particularly about the National Freight Advisory Committee that was recently formed. Uh, and I just wanted to know what sort of role they play because they seem to be a uh, a shorter term avenue to bringing together some of the parties that are around that circle. Yeah, I, I think you make an excellent point. As you know, there was a time when um, we actually, um, what would you say, um, some of those uh, entities were uh, at least um, held in abeyance for a time. But I think we've worked through that and uh, clearly you've got to have public-private partnerships. You've got to have regulators uh, engaged with industry. That's the way the business is done. And I think you can do that without being overly influenced, if you will. And that's what's at the, you know, at the tension point of that particular uh, discussion. But I think this new freight um, um, uh, effort is uh, one of the great benefits of the new bill. Uh, you actually have two new freight programs specifically uh, uh, designed in the bill. Uh, this is the FAST Act. Uh, and I think that it's a great opportunity for the trucking community, the rail community, uh, for those who are interested in drones, by the way. Uh, I was at a meeting um, uh, just um, the day before yesterday. Uh, we were at our office in Palo Alto, and we had assembled a number of uh, individuals uh, looking at the transportation system of the future. Uh, and so we were talking about drones. We were talking about um, high-speed rail, maglev. Uh, we were talking about space tourism, uh, autonomous vehicles. I mean, it was a fascinating discussion. And I think it, interesting that that discussion was occurring uh, in Silicon Valley, uh, but also that same discussion is now uh, occurring in pockets across the U.S. Uh, in this region, to be sure, because this is the seat of government, but also in Detroit. I mean, you can't go to Detroit and not see Intel, Ericsson, Qualcomm, Verizon, AT&T. You see where I'm going? Google. I mean, it's amazing what's going on out there. It's truly fascinating. And so freight, uh, you know, even though a lot of times we're focusing on the movement of people, I mean, that's where the romance is, right? You know, uh, transportation is the tie that binds, uh, Route 66. I mean, you know, it's, it, we think about the movement of people, but it's really the movement of freight that helps business do business. 
So it's transportation plays an important role in that regard, and I'm so very pleased to see that the federal government is now going to have this advisory uh, committee, and I would encourage you, if you have names, uh, feel free to engage the secretary. He would welcome that. Mr. Uh, Secretary, my name is uh, James Dalton. I come from the uh, Corps of Engineers, and uh, yeah. uh, as you know, we work uh, a lot in areas of uh, transportation uh, for navigation, and ports, yeah. and those kind of things. Uh, but one of the things that, that Michael said about the, uh, the, the public sector, which uh, obviously I'm a part of, is that we tend to look at things in stovepipes. Mm. Yeah. And then Terry talked about what the UK has done to, to sort of advance uh, BIM and its advantage in helping us to deliver products uh, better and faster, et cetera. My question to you, having sit, sat in the position that you were in, is what would your advice be as to how we would actually break down those stovepipes? Uh, you know, Secretary of uh, Transportation is obviously one of those, but I mean, we have things like flood risk uh, that we're also looking at. We have water supply. Uh, mm -hmm. All of that depends on our infrastructure. And so having sat in that seat, I would ask, what would your advice be to this organization to help sort of break down those stovepipes and have some national initiatives like uh, the UK has with BIM? Sure, sure. Well, first of all, let me uh, commend uh, your group for the great work that you do. I mean, um, uh, this is, um, you know, this is um, what a, um, a maritime nation, really. I mean, our major... Uh, means of uh, uh, transportation early on were our um, navigable waterways. I mean, that's really uh, how we were able to grow so fast and to become so, uh, the economic force that we were able to become so so quickly. Uh, but, uh, but you're right to note that uh, we do operate um, somewhat in stovepipes. Uh, I, I tried to address that when I was secretary, and I know that Secretary Fox is looking at it in some interesting ways as well. But um, r r um, remember, I mentioned that I had been a Federal Highway Administrator, right? That's one of the modes. And uh, Federal Highways has been a pretty dominant mode in years past, and still is. I mean, because highways are the backbone of the system. Um, you know, 100,000... Uh, department. Federal highways was roughly 5,000. So it's small in number, but accounted for half the budget. And if you look at federal highways, because it's been around for so long, actually the first person who had the Office of Road Inquiry, which was the forerunner of the Federal Highway Administrator, I mean administration, uh, his name was uh, Stone, uh, and he fought at Gettysburg. All right? And if you go to uh, uh, Gettysburg, there is Stone Avenue. And so I, I make the point that it was an entity that had been around for a long time. It has a division office in every state. And its principal interface is with the governor and the state highway department. That is a powerful organization. But at the end of the day, if that power is only used for its benefit, you don't have the transit needs of the, of the nation met. You don't have the rail needs of the nation met. And so one thing that we really tried to focus on was called intermodal connectors. And I would suggest that that is a sweet spot for you to think about because that is, that's sort of the node, it's almost like a circle where you could technically have a rail line, you could have a port, you could have a highway, you follow me? And one of the finest examples of this is the Alameda Corridor uh, connecting uh, the ports of uh, LA and Long Beach. And it runs through tw some 20 communities uh, and you've got rail lines. But that was a major focus for us to, to really build on that, um, on that project. I think that there is magic in those nodes, you know, at those points of interaction and tension. But you have to have people working collectively to, to do that. Uh, what, um, what we started talking about when I came, became secretary was one DOT. And the whole objective was to start breaking down the barriers culturally 
uh, it's difficult to do it uh, structurally just because different uh, committees in the Congress have responsibility for uh, the various modes, and it's not likely that they will anytime soon uh, give up that power and their ability to, you know, kind of target those that they want to, um, to deal with. But you can philosophically, I think, start to deal with it with the concept like one DOT. That's what we tried to do. Uh, we also took a person by the name of Jack Basso, who was my budget guy. Uh, Jack was amazing. Uh, and uh, what he could do at the end of a fiscal year in finding a million here, a million there, a million there. I mean, you think about that. It really allows you to say to a city or a state, we can help you with that. You see? Some of the finest ideas can come to you in that way because the monies that you have distributed to them through the various formulas don't quite get them there. And so at the end of the fiscal year, and very few people knew about this, your more senior members of Congress knew about it, and Jack Basso knew about it. And I'm telling you, when you can help a member who is important to the Coast Guard with a highway project, you see where I'm going with this? Or if you, as a member of the Federal Highway Administration going into a member's office can say, we are so proud of our sister agency, the Coast Guard, because just the other day off the coast of whatever, whatever, there was this, tr this tremendous rescue that saved and did this, this, and this. And so the story to my team members was, look, we can sometimes satisfy a member with what we do for them from this particular office. But we miss so much when there is the opportunity to assist them and to serve them and to appeal to them when it comes from this office, this office, this office. And so one DOT started to make a lot of sense. And Jack Basso, <laughs> was actually lifted from my office <laughs> to the secretary's office by Secretary Pena. Good move by him. Tremendous loss to me. Uh, but fortunately, we got a chance to work together a little later when I became secretary. And one thing we did to sort of force the issue of um, working together, and that's why the money issue is so very important here and how that's structured, is we forced all of the agencies to make their case about their budget in front of all of the members of the DOT family. So Federal Highways could no longer just come to the Secretary and say, this is what we've got to have. No, they had to make that case in front of the Coast Guard, the Federal Transit Administration, the Federal Aviation Administration. You see where I'm going with this? And, and what happened as a result of that process is that we were able to fund the most significant, the most important projects. This is the last point, and then maybe we, we want to wrap up. I actually think that the most significant decision that was made during our time was not so much all of the major bills that were passed, and they, they were many. They were record level at the time. We were just fortunate to get some things done. Uh, maybe because when I first got there, uh, Chairman Schuster and uh, Congressman Mineta, who would become the chairman, afforded me a great experience. They allowed me to go on a trip, a Codell, to Germany and to Russia and all of these places. And for a guy from uh, Mariana, Arkansas, which is a little larger than this room, okay? <laughs> That was an eye-opening experience. But I'll tell you what it really, really was. It was an opportunity to break bread with them, to get to know them, to get to know them beyond a congressional hearing where 
I'm going through a process to be confirmed. This was an opportunity for them to say to me, you've got a great opportunity. We want to be helpful to you. If you ever have a question, give me a call. If you can't reach me, you just can't. That's almost like getting a blueprint. <laughs> and that's where I end as I began. You can't beat it. So I encourage you, be as kind to those new members who come into an administration as were those members and their staffs to me. Give them the benefit of your thinking, your insight, your support. And you don't have to sugarcoat it. Nobody's looking for that. They just want honest, authentic dialogue. And at the end of the day, it's all about relationships. Because at the end of the day, it's all about trust. The secretary was kind enough to come. He has to uh, catch a plane. But I, I do want to uh, mention one thing. I, um, you know, a, a number of people asked me when they, I was trying to get them to join Blueprint 2025, they said, well, what makes you think you can do this? You know, you're, you're just Norm Anderson. And I said, well, I know Gordon, and Gordon knows Secretary Slater. And that was, what, that was my, my argument. So thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Secretary Slater. And it's just a pleasure to be able to work with you. So thank you so much. And now it's my pleasure.